up, good buddy. Welcome to our here and there church. Here at Lord of the Harvest and there wherever you're at. So I'm gonna open up with Psalms 101. I will sing of your love and justice to you, Lord. I will sing praise. I will be careful to lead the blameless life. When will you come to me? I will conduct the affairs of my house with a blameless heart. I will not look with approval on anything that is vile. Really, who of us is blameless? How did we get there? Uh, we're not blameless. And the only way we got there was through Jesus, through his blood. Um, how can we get our life blameless? Is by sticking with his word and trying to live like David in the psalm that uh, he stuck with the Lord all the way through and he got favor. And um, So, Lord, I pray, Lord, that you give us the will, Lord, to... Uh, to really get into your word, Lord, and uh, we thank you, Jesus, for uh, giving up your life for us, Lord, to uh, get our sins forgiven, Lord, and uh, the only way we can be blameless is through you, Lord, and uh, amen, Lord. Praise this morning. He really yeah. does. Amen. He's good all the time. And I want you to really just imagine the Lord right here, right now, and how much we want to tell him how much we appreciate what he has done for us at the cross, Amen. in the resurrection in the ascension and then sending us the holy spirit hallelujah lord we want to worship you hallelujah so everybody join us we're going to do some acapella worship and i know the lord is waiting amen more love more power more of you in my life, more love, more power, more of you in my life, more love, more love, more power, yes. more More love, more power, more of you in my life, and I will worship you with all of my heart, and I will worship you with all of my mind. you with all of my strength for you are my Lord yes yes Lord With all of my heart, and I will worship you with all of my mind, and I will worship you with all of my strength, for you are my Lord. And I will 
worship you with all of my heart. And I will worship you with all of my mind. And I will worship you with all of my strength. Lord, we need more. Hallelujah. Yes, In this Lord. hour, Come we on, need Jesus. more of you, Lord. Yes, Lord. Hallelujah. Yes, Lord. You must increase, yes. oh God, and we must decrease, Father God. Expand your spirit within us, your very holy nature within us, oh God. Yes, Lord. Hallelujah. And cause that which needs to decrease, go to the cross, yes, Lord God. Lord Jesus, we appeal to your heart this morning. We ask, Lord God, for divine intervention yes. in what is going on in this hour. Yes, we ask for wisdom and yes, direction, God. We yes, look to Lord. You, yes, Lord. Lord. We bow before you, Lord, between the mystery of what we yet do not understand, yes. Father God. Amen. But we trust you. We radically trust yes, you, God. Yes, Lord, because we know you Hallelujah. are with us, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Our Lord God. Thank Hallelujah. you, Jesus. Thank you for Hallelujah, your leading, Lord. Lord. Glory to your name. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we ask the spirit of worship would go out into yes. the airways, Lord God. We yes. ask the spirit of worship would go from this place into the neighborhood. Yes, bathe the, the neighborhood, Lord, we with your worship. For, Hallelujah. For city Thank you, Jesus. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Do it, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Do it, Lord. Hallelujah. Yes, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You are worthy, Lord. You are the worthy Hallelujah. lamb. Yes. The lion of the tribe Thank of you, Judah. Jesus. Hallelujah. Worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive Power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. Worthy is the Thank you, Jesus. Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. Worthy is the Lamb, worthy is the Lamb, worthy is the Lamb. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We worship yes, you, Lord. We do, God. Yes, we do. You are worthy. Hallelujah. You are worthy. Hallelujah. You are worthy. Hallelujah. You know, this is the word of God. 
We are singing the book of Revelation yes. back to the Father. Come, Lord what an Jesus. amazing, amazing thing, Father. Yes. Lord, we need a revelation, yes. Lord, that we are connected, Holy Lord. Spirit. The earth is connected to yes, heaven, Lord, Lord God. The earth is joining the saints, Lord, yes, that are before Lord. your throne. Even yes. now is a spirit. Yes. Hallelujah. Lord, we worship you, God. Thank we you, bless your holy name. You're worthy. Worthy is the Lamb. 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 Worthy state of worship have your hearts and your minds open and vulnerable to the spirit as the word comes forth yes honestly we are going in places we have never been before Amen. and i realize that more and more as the weeks are going by that oh man god oh but god we, is going to show up Amen. he is going to show up in our day and in our time, you will remember mercy. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, this is a part of our service where we do communion. So if you're at home and don't have um, your communion, you're going to want to get it ready. Um, amen. That worship was awesome. And, um, you know, I want to tag on to what uh, Pastor Janine was sharing about his coming. And... Uh, how the Lord really brought me to this place was uh, Steve Fado and his uh, group is going to be doing um, a 12-hour uh, prayer session next Saturday that um, from Revelation, the Spirit and the Bride say, come. And when I was reading through that email, I, I just got so excited. And I'm like, you know what, Lord, this reminds me always, the scripture always reminded me of the verses in Isaiah 55. So that's what I want to read, and I want to just share the little bit. It's not going to be much what the Lord put on my heart. I believe this is not even so much about the words that I am saying, but the actions that I am doing today. And I believe that the Lord is really moving powerfully, yeah. and his coming is, is, is just forthcoming, his presence. This uh, Isaiah 55, uh, verse 1 through 3, it is actually titled in the commentary that I um, read, the great proclamation yes. the great proclamation and that's what i believe god wants me to do today is to declare yes. his forthcoming yes. Yes, Lord. do it preach it all right let me read it it says ho yes. everyone who thirsts come to the waters lord god we ask lord that this would go yes. forth as pastor janine said out into the highways and the byways, Lord. Out into the houses, Lord God. The open windows. Ho! Yeah. Everyone who thirsts, yeah. come to the waters. Yes. And you who have no money, yes. come by and eat. Yes, come. Buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend money on what is not bread? And your wages for what does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me, says the Lord, and yes. eat what is good. Yes. And let your soul delight itself in abundance. Incline you. your ear and come to me, says the Lord. Hear, and your soul shall live. And I will make an everlasting covenant with you, yes. the sure mercies of David. Yes. Do you know what that whole means? It means to proclaim like a herald with a loud voice, yes. clearly and plainly delivering the message, capital T, yes. of Jesus. Yes. Thank you. It is a sign that something important and often guaranteed good is shortly to happen. Shortly to happen. Thank you, Lord. All the generosity of God is summed up in this verse. 
We bring nothing. We can bring nothing that would even come near to what he gives to us. And it costs us nothing. This is what he asks. That we would realize that there is no source of our own that can provide these things. We need to thirst. Are you thirsty today? I don't know about you, but I'm thirsty. We have to listen to what he's told us and we have to obey it. And we have to delight our soul in abundance. Do you know that there is a poverty of spirit that we have that refuses abundance? Do you realize that? It's everywhere. We refuse abundance. God wants to abundantly provide for us these things that cannot be destroyed. So I want us to do together today, join with me. Would you please? Yes. And a shout, a ho, a proclamation to the neighborhood, to the highways and the byways, to the nations, that our heart would receive the goodness that God has for us. This is a prophetic act. I know it sounds silly. No, it doesn't. It's embarrassing, maybe, but so what? So what? All right, are we ready? On the count of three. One. Two, three. Oh. Ho! Yes, yes. And in the name of Jesus, I declare that this is to be a sign that something, Jesus, important is coming to us shortly. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for your body, Lord. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for your body. Thank you for your body. You should all have your notes. Yes, we do. You don't have your notes. There's some on the table, or you can go on your phone. Uh, those of you who are watching, uh, these notes are on the website. It's going to be part two of the prophetic nature of the church. I mentioned last week that now, uh, more than ever in this hour, we really need to understand the true spirit of prophecy that needs to come on, on the church and on the body of Christ in this hour. We are living in a time where false prophecy has taken over the narrative. And false prophecy and false teaching are basically the same phenomena. Those of us who are more uh, of a charismatic nature, we may call it false prophecy. Uh, those who are of uh, a, a different persuasion, a different tradition, we call it false teaching. But it's here in the world in our nation and in the church and we really need to see the rise of the prophetic nature of the church and that gift of prophecy coming forth we mentioned last week that in revelation 19 verse 10 it says that the spirit of prophecy is the testimony of jesus bearing witness to jesus is the spirit of prophecy and that's what it is it's to disclose jesus to unveil Jesus, to find the hidden Jesus in the midst of our circumstances, the midst of our situations. So now we're going to go look at the notes and we're going to go to the start of the notes. Uh, I've divided these notes into the prophet in the Old Testament, the prophet in the New Testament, the prophet in the book of Revelation. We actually started with part three last week looking at the prophet in the book of Revelation. And then part four is false prophecy, which we'll look at as well. We're going to look at the Old Testament today. Now remember, the Old Testament provides for us structure and pattern. We are not under the Old Covenant anymore. We're under the New Covenant. But what makes both the Old Covenant and the New Covenant valid is Christ. 
There's a Christological center to the Old Testament. Jesus was there in the Old Testament from, from, from time immemorial, from the time that the, the Old Covenant Scriptures were put into writing. Jesus was there. He just wasn't seen. He's cl seen very clearly in the New Testament Scriptures. But nonetheless, at the end of the New Testament, you have the book of Revelation, which is a, a book that's called a prophecy. And it, it talks about an unveiling of Jesus. So even under New Covenant terms, under the Gospel, we need the office of a prophet. We need the gift of prophecy. We need the prophetic nature of the church to constantly being there to disclose Jesus, to reveal Jesus. And the example we used last week is, where is Jesus in the current global pandemic? Where is Jesus in the, the racial and civil discourse in our nation? Where is Jesus in the economic breakdown? Where is Jesus in the, the great political divide in our country? Where is Jesus as, as martyrdom in the 20th and the 21st century is greater than in the, the first 19 centuries of the church history? Where is Jesus? So that's what we're looking for. But we are going to look at the structure and pattern of prophecy and, and, and prophet and the prophetic nature of God's people, first of all, in the Old Testament. There are changes from the Old Testament to the New Testament, and we'll see that. One of the dangers that we see in, in the current church is that individuals who call themselves prophets have a tendency to define what it means to be a prophet more by the Old Testament than the New Testament. That's a danger. And, and the reason for that danger is in the Old Testament, I actually have this note. Uh, if you look down at part two, the New Testament, the prophetic function of the church, number one says, the New Testament is characterized by prophetic teams. We, we have the school of the prophets in the Old Testament, but that there's a difference in the way the, the, the office of the prophet functioned in the Old Testament from the way it functions in the New. New Testament is always characterized by not a prophet, but prophets, plural. It's characterized by prophetic teams. Here is the key difference between the Old Testament office of a prophet and how we exercise it in the New Testament. And this came from Keith Hazel and Rich Gow and that incredible teaching that, that we got from them years and years ago. In the Old Testament, one man was raised up to address the nation. It's this one man, single man figure. It's Isaiah. It's Jeremiah, it's Ezekiel. They're raised up. Hosea, Amos, one man is raised up and it's the word of the Lord for the entire nation. Well, that day has been and gone. Prophets now who characterize themselves after that are mistaken. The one man, whether it's a, a one man king or a one man prophet, Oh, the one-man show of the Old Testament. Moses, the one man. Elijah, the one man. That was to prefigure the one man who was coming. There would be one man who would come, who would change everything. And he's prophet, priest, king, pastor, evangelist, teacher. He's all of those things. It's Jesus. Now that Jesus has come, there's no more need for one man. This one man idea is false. It's, it's actually fueled by a spirit of false prophecy. No one presidential figure is going to save us. See, that's all old covenant reality. The one man has come and his name is Jesus. Hallelujah. And, and since Jesus has come, there's no more need in the church for a one-man show. It's teams now. 
it's the body of Christ. The New Testament is Christ-centered and church-centered. Yes. That's why we've always said, somebody calls himself or herself a prophet, what church sent you out? Whose hands were laid on you? What church do you return to to authorize your prophetic ministry? Because it's about Christ, the church, and it's about teams. So understanding that, we can still go to the Old Testament and draw principles, principles of how the prophetic office works. We just need to center them in Christ. So I'm going to try to get through part one and part two here. Uh, I mean, uh, part one, numbers one and number two, the structure and pattern. First of all, we look at the function of the prophet. Now, I point out three things here, and we need to see this. I want to point out those three aspects of how a prophet functions, and then we'll look at some of the specific verses. First of all, prophets prophesy the word of the Lord. Prophets prophesy. I mean, that makes sense, doesn't it? But here's the thing. Prophecy is a gift of the Holy Spirit, and anyone in the body of Christ can exercise it. 1 Corinthians 14 says that. Just prophesying a lot does not make somebody a prophet. See, there there are people that go around and they prophesy left and right over everybody they see, over everything that moves. They prophesy, they prophesy. That does not make a person a prophet. It means that it, it... means the person may have a strong gift of prophecy and that's okay but that doesn't that alone does not make a prophet so there there are are a lot of misunderstandings in the body of Christ and misunderstandings lead to misbehavior and misbehavior leads to to problems in the body of Christ just because somebody prophesies a lot don't call them prophet. That doesn't make a person a prophet. It simply means somebody prophesies a lot. It doesn't mean they're not accurate either, but again, prophesying is not the only task of a prophet. And this is where the Old Testament helps us. All the Old Testament prophets prophesy. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, and Hosea, Joel, Amos, their books are, are, are full of prophecies. And in some of the minor prophets, uh, those, those 12 prophets uh, at the end of the Christian Old Testament, it's, it's pure prophecy. The, the, the entire, their entire book is just one prophecy after another. But the prophets did something else. They interpreted history. See, this is, this is what's so important. When you move from the gift of prophecy to the office of a prophet, prophets interpret history. And what I mean by that is a prophet can look at what's going on and interpret it based on Scripture. They don't interpret it based on their opinions. They don't interpret it based on subjective experiences. They are men and women of the Word of God. Prophecy uh, has gotten too much to be about subjective opinions and dreams and visions and all this. Dreams and visions come and go. The Word of God has to be the center of any leader in the body of Christ. And prophets would look at, the prophets looked at Genesis Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. That was their foundation. That was their gospel. We have the gospels as our foundation. They had the law of Moses. They had the Pentateuch. And they would look at scriptures and see what God said would happen if we obey and if we disobey. And from being immersed in scripture, they could take scripture and superimpose it on history and say, aha, this is what's going on. 
thus says the Lord. That's, that's why how the prophets knew that, that the children of Israel were going to go into exile. They knew Assyria was going to destroy Israel and take Israel away. They knew Israel was uh, Babylon would destroy Judah and take Judah away. Why? Because Scripture said, if you obey me, if you worship me, if you follow my word, here's what will happen. Blessings. God's benefits wonderful shalom but if you disobey you're going into exile well that's how they knew they were going into exile it just it never happened and so when when the prophets got up before Assyria took away Israel and said we're going into exile the people said ha we're the people of God faith not fear that can't happen here and it got even worse with Jeremiah Jeremiah almost lost his life because nobody believed that God would be faithful to his word everybody just claimed the blessings of the Lord it can't happen in America I said in 2016 before the election the fact that we have to choose between Trump and Clinton, the country's already under judgment. I'm going to say it before 2020. The fact that we have to choose between Trump and Biden, country's already under judgment. See, nobody wants to believe that. Everybody wants to say, oh, this one's God's man, or this one's God's man, or this one's God's woman. Well, Jesus is God's man. Yes. Jesus is God's man. Jeremiah, can you imagine? He was the one man raised up for the nation, and nobody believed him. Well, a handful of people believed him, but nobody believed him. But he understood what was going to happen, not just because he had some kind of a dream and a vision. I remember Keith Hazel telling me once, he said, a lot of these people, these so-called national prophets, he goes, they're seers. They're not prophets. They're, they're visionaries. They have vision after vision after vision. And that's actually significant to our argument today. We'll, we'll, we'll look at in the book of Samuel shortly. They hear the Lord. They see a vision. They experience this. He goes, but that doesn't make somebody a prophet. Prophets have to have this divine perspective of history. So prophets interpret history according to scripture. Letter C, and this is the one that is so important to this hour. Prophets evaluate the correct use or abuse of power. God gives the governments of the world power. Romans 13 says that. And then you just hear Christians saying, yeah, we got to submit to what, whatever the authority of the United States is. We got to submit to it because that's what Romans 13 says. That's not what Romans 13 says. Jesus said, render to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. I give the governments of the world authority for peace in the earth. But when those governments violate my word, I raise up prophets to speak to the abuse of power. I've said this many times. Yes, Romans 13 says submit. Well, you have to have Revelation 13 with <laughs> Romans 13. Revelation 13 in, in Romans 13, the government is seen as the minister of God, and the government is. In Revelation 13, the government is seen as the beast who opposes the purposes of God. We submit and we resist based on the truth of the gospel. And prophets need to lead the way. When there is an abuse of power, prophets need 
to speak to that. Prophets need to speak to that. And see, taking Romans 13 with Revelation 13, you have Jesus in the Gospels. Render to Caesar what is Caesar's, Romans 13, and to God what is God's, Revelation 13. The relationship of prophets to the kings, Saul, David, Solomon, and the kings of the divided kingdom illustrates the purpose of the office of the prophet is to submit kingly authority, political power, governmental power to the authority of the word of God. Prophetic activity also multiplies during the divided kingdom. When Israel and Judah separate, all of a sudden more prophets are raised up. Because when the church is in division, when God's people are in division, we need prophets. Prophets bring unity, not division. These so-called prophets that have their own personal agenda and build on that agenda to enhance their prophetic standing, they create division. They're not true prophets. Now let's look to the word. And, and I, 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 want, I, I want to really hone in on part C. But let's look at them all. Let's, let's start in 1 Kings 13. And let me locate that. Turn on your cell phones to 1 Kings 13. Chapter 1 and 2, or verses 1 and 2. 1 Kings 13, 1 and 2. Reading out of the ESV. And behold, a man of God came out of Judah by the word of the Lord to Bethel. Prophets prophesy the word of the Lord. They, their ministry revolves around the word of the Lord. Their actions are motivated by the word of the Lord. And the words they say are motivated by the word of the Lord. Jeroboam, that's a king, was standing by the altar to make offerings. We have a problem there. Who makes offerings of sacrifices for the people? Priests do, not kings. Jeroboam took authority to himself that he did not have. Do you understand that kings and presidents and congresses who have authority given them by God can still nonetheless cross the lines of their authority and start doing things that their authority does not allow them to do. So the man of God cried against the altar by the word of the Lord. So what he does and what he says, this is the function of the prophet. Prophets function according to the word of the Lord. O altar, altar, thus says the Lord. Behold, a son shall be born to the house of David, Josiah by name, and he shall sacrifice on you the priests of the high places who make offerings on you, and human bones shall be burned on you. He prophesied the name of a king 250 years before that king was even going to be alive. Prophets prophesy according to the word of the Lord. Next, prophets interpret history according to scripture. Look at Daniel chapter 9, verses 1 and 2. Watch how Daniel's one of, this is one of the most powerful prophecies in the history of the Old Testament. He's going to prophesy at the end of Daniel 9 when the Messiah is going to come. And he's prophesying it 500 some years before it even takes place. But here's where it starts. How, how does Daniel get to that place? He has a lot of dreams and visions, but here's where he gets to the place this time. Daniel 9.1, in the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, by descent a Mede who was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans, in the first year of his kingly reign, I, Daniel, perceived in the books 
the number of years that according to the word of the Lord to Jeremiah the prophet must pass before the end of the desolations of Jerusalem, namely 70 years. He's reading a prophecy. He's reading scripture. He's reading a prophecy that Daniel pro or that Jeremiah prophesied years earlier and he's looking at scripture and he's interpreting history based on the word of the Lord that came through Jeremiah. By the way, that's a good Old Testament example of prophets functioning together too. Prophets interpret history according to scripture. I really want to look though at this, this relationship between prophets and kings. Now go with me to 1 Samuel. And we'll start with 1 Samuel. Uh, I don't have this uh, verse referenced in the notes. We'll get it in the updated notes. 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse 20. 1 Samuel 3. And actually I'll start with verse 19. And Samuel grew, and the Lord was with him, and let none of his words fall to the ground. And all Israel, from Dan to Beersheba, knew that Samuel was established as a prophet of the Lord. And the Lord appeared again at Shiloh, for the Lord revealed himself to Samuel at Shiloh by the word of the Lord. And we see a couple things. There's that, that word of the Lord is there with Daniel, it's there with Samuel, it's there with the man of God from Judah. The word of the Lord is the motivating factor for the prophets. Second, we see that Samuel is called a prophet. And third, the Lord appears to the prophet to commission him. Now, we are not saying that there were no prophets before the time of Samuel. But the scripture that we're going to read suggests that Samuel actually doesn't start off quote unquote as a prophet even though he's called that. He starts out as a judge. The time of the kings in 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, 1st and 2nd Chronicles is a transitionary time. There is no kingship in Israel before Saul and David and Solomon. Israel is ruled by judges at that point. I want you to see this. Now, Samuel's called a prophet in 1 Samuel 3 before his ministry starts. Advance to 1 Samuel 7. This is in the notes. Look at 1 Samuel 7. And go to verse 15. Now this is Samuel as he advances. In 1 Samuel 3, he's just a young man and he's established as a prophet. But here was his primary function until the kingship. The kingship starts in 1 Samuel 10. In 1 Samuel 7, judges are still ruling Israel. Now look. When, when, there are prophets before the time of Samuel. Moses is called a prophet. Moses is the prophet par excellence who leads the people from Egypt into the land. He's called a prophet. But you don't see the mention of the word prophet too much until we get to the time of the kings. And there's, there's a reason for that. The first reference to a prophet in the Old Testament, and, and this, these, these references will show you, these references will show you the structure and the pattern of the office of prophecy. The first mention of a prophet, and you don't have to turn to it, it's Genesis 20, verse 7. It says, Abraham is a prophet, and, and the Lord tells the king, go seek Abraham, he's a prophet, and he'll pray for you. Do you understand the very first reference to a prophet in the Old Testament has to do with intercessory prayer. Prophets must be intercessors. Prophets must have a rich prayer life. The prophet who doesn't have a rich prayer life as well as the prophet who doesn't have a rich foundation in the Word of God, well, chances are they're not prophets. Or they're on their way to becoming false prophets. 
prophets generate prophetic reality by their intercession. I don't know what's more important about a prophet. A prophet prophesying or a prophet interceding. The next reference to prophets are in Exodus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Moses is called a prophet. Actually, Aaron's called a prophet. In Exodus 7, verse 1, remember when the Lord said, Moses, go to Pharaoh and tell him to let my people go, and Moses says, I stutter, I can't do this. I, I have problems the way I talk. You want to talk about a model for this disabled folk, Moses had a severe stuttering problem. And God said, I don't care. I put my word in his mouth. See, that's the thing about prophets prophesying to the word of the Lord. What happens when Isaiah's commissioned? An angel touches his mouth with a coal. What happens when Jeremiah's commissioned? I will put my words in your mouth, Jeremiah. What happens when Ezekiel's commissioned? Ezekiel, eat this scroll. Put it in your mouth and eat it. I'm putting my word in your mouth. But in order to help Moses get beyond his struggles, he says, well, that's all right. I'll speak to you. You speak to Aaron. Aaron will be your prophet. He says, Aaron will be your mouthpiece. Aaron will speak for you. If, if, you're, if you're concerned about your problem, Aaron will take care of it. There's a prophet raised up in Judges. The Midianites are afflicting the people of God. They cry out to the Lord and the Lord sends a prophet. So prophets intercede and prophets are raised up in times of deliverance and inheritance for the people of God, like Moses and Aaron, and they're raised up in times when they are being, when the people of God are being oppressed. So there are prophets, but there's not a lot of mention of prophets before Samuel. Here's what it says about Samuel in verse 15 of 1 Samuel 7. Samuel judged Israel all the days of his life, and he went on a circuit year by year to Bethel, Gilgal, and Mizpah, and he judged Israel in all these places. Then he would return to Ramah, for his home was there, and there also he judged Israel. And he built there an altar to the Lord. Even though he's, we know that he's a prophet, and we know that prophets occurred before the kingship, primarily he began to minister as a judge. The Hebrew word for judge is shapat. It's a word that's used for how a king rules. A king rules according to shapat. And what comes out of shapat is mishpat. Mishpat is justice. A judge is one who enforces with kingly authority the justice of God. See, the real heart of what the kingship is to be is the kingship is to be aligned with justice. The cries to hold the president responsible for justice and injustice or the cries to hold a future president accountable to justice and injustice is biblical. That is to be the first, the first motivation of a of a ruler of a nation, not the economy, not a political agenda, not I'll take care of my own and seek vengeance against those who are not my own. It's justice. And it comes from the word shapat. So initially when there were no kings, the prophet as a judge was the one who enforced God's justice. Now we know, of course, the people say, we want a king. And you know the whole story about we want a king. Samuel objects, you don't need a king. The Lord's your king. And the Lord says, listen to him. Why, Lord? Because sometimes you learn by making mistakes. Remember that, America. Sometimes you learn by supporting the wrong candidates. 
and calling it of God. It is of God. Saul was of God. He was of God to humble Israel and bring Israel back to the Lord. This idea of what's of God. See, again, in America, what's of God has to be something that does good for me. If it does good for me, it's of God. <clears throat> Scripture never, never defines good by something does good for me. What is good is what increases the purposes of God. Now, watch what happens. Go with me to 1 Samuel chapter 9. This is where Saul is chosen to be king. And Saul, at the, the start of this choice, there's some biographical data of the king, and, he, and, and Saul needs a prophet. He needs to hear a prophet speak to him. He's uncertain about himself and his direction in life. He needs to hear a prophet. And so, verse 8 of 1 Samuel 9, Saul's servant answered Saul and said, Here I have with me a quarter of a shekel of silver, and I will give it to the man of God to tell us our way. He needs direction. He's got to find something he's lost. And notice, talks about going to a prophet, paying the prophet, and the prophet gives you a prophecy. Now, we see that all the time nowadays. You get in the $100 line, the $20 line, the $10 line, you get a better prophecy. Well, see, that's Old Testament, brother, and we don't need that anymore. New Testament is this. Freely you have received, now freely give. But this is the reality here. And notice the comment. Formerly in Israel, when a man went to inquire of God, he said, Come, let us go to the seer. A seer is a visionary in Hebrew. Somebody who has visions and dreams and hears the voice of the Lord. But a seer is not a prophet. It's a seer. It's a visionary. It's somebody who's, who's good in the supernatural realm. But your seers can be equally a, prof, a, a, a person who has a, a strong gift of prophecy. They can be a medium or a fortune teller. They could be a shaman. They have this access to the spirit realm. Does everybody understand that somebody who's a shaman can tell you things that are accurate? Do you understand you can go to a shaman for a healing or for a demon cast out and they, they might be able to do it? It's been done for all history. These things happen. It doesn't make it legitimate. But watch the language here. For today's prophet was formerly called a seer. See, with Samuel being a prophet, he's, Samuel is moving from the time of judges into the time of the kingship and what this is saying is prophets are now going to come into preeminence. Why? Because when kings are established, you need someone to evaluate the use and the abuse of power of the king. And then we go on next in chapter 10, verse 1 of 1 Samuel. There's this announcement that we're going to have prophets. Now, the prophetic office is going to be established more significantly than it has in previous history in Israel because it says in 10.1, Then Samuel took a flask of oil and poured it on Saul's head and kissed him and said, Has not the Lord anointed you to be prince over his people Israel? See, prophets increase wherever there are kings. There's a close-knit relationship between prophets and kings because prophets are called to judge power. Now listen to me. I'm not speaking to charismatics here. Some people have said, well, that's good that you're teaching on prophets and prophetic nature, but there are a lot of people who aren't charismatics who don't use the same language. You don't have to use the same language. 
Martin Luther King Jr. was a prophet. God raised him up and he addressed the abuse of power in this nation. He was a prophet. You, you don't have to have this charismatic structure. See, the charismatics, we don't have the corner on the market of the office of prophecy or the office of prophet, the gift of prophecy. We think we do. See, there's sectarian thinking. Every prophet has to be somebody who prophesies and has visions and dreams and says this is going to happen and that's going to happen. The point by my giving you an A, B, and C is there are different functions of prophets. There are men and women out there who would never call themselves a prophet. They might not even believe that prophets exist anywhere, but they study history according to the scripture and they say, you know, this is what's going to happen. They're prophets. That's part of the prophetic function of the church. Don't limit the office of a prophet to what the charismatics and Pentecostals do. There are people who stand for justice and against injustice, and they may not have any kind of charismatic prophetic terminology. They are prophets because they're calling heaven to note injustice, misuse of power, abuse of power. And what's interesting about this, the, these, this it, it just speaks of the div divisiveness that's in the church right now. Charismatics have this, this whole ethos of prophecy and spiritual gifts, but they tend to lack the reality of understanding of justice. I, I don't hear a lot of prophets, Christian prophets, in the charismatic, apostolic, prophetic category getting up, talking about the seriousness, how justice is a central concept to the Word of God and the Gospel. Well, somebody's going to get a lot of notes. Let them, let them go. Just let them go. Let, let, let people Get some notes. Maybe they'll learn something about the prophetic, right? <laughs> and on the other hand, on the other hand, a lot of people who are fighting injustice, they don't understand the importance of thus says the Lord. Boy, the church has to get together. See, brethren, if we could get beyond this evangelical, charismatic, Democrat, Republican, white, black, if male, female, young, old, if we could get beyond that division, how powerful the church would be. Yeah. Amen. All right. A couple minutes, and I just want to look at the points in number two, the prophet's message, and we'll, we'll, we'll pick up with that next week. The prophet's message. The Lord is active in the history of his people in terms of judgment or mercy. That's what a prophet does. Anytime you see a person declaring that the Lord, Yahweh, that Jesus is active in the history of his people to show mercy or to bring judgment, that's a prophetic word. The prophets are always bringing people back to the imminent presence of the Lord. See, God is transcendent and he's imminent. Transcendent means he's everywhere. He is everywhere, whether you see him or not. Imminent means he's right there with us. He's Emmanuel. He's God's with us. Do you feel his presence? Do you know his love? Do you know fellowship with him? Do you know his intimacy? Do you know those things? Well, see, that's what the prophet does. The Lord is active in the history of his people in terms of judgment or mercy. And it's not just with a few individuals. It's all of his people. Number two, the prophet's message asks this question. Have the people of God been faithful to the Lord's purposes or not? There's your judgment and mercy. Prophets are always looking at the gospel. New Testament prophets look at the gospel and say, is how we are living, is what we are teaching, is our worldview, are our values consistent with what Jesus has revealed of God 
in the Gospels, in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. C, the prophet's message. Exile comes with disobedience. See, that's the law function in the Old Testament of the office of a prophet. They have a law function. It means they prosecute legally. And a legal prosecution says when you break the law, you pay a penalty. But you see, that's not the only function of the prophet. And, and there's, there's a kind of, that's a really an old covenant distortion. Prophets are just, they're always going to judge everybody. And they're always going to be in people's faces. And they're always going to be saying gloom and doom. Well, there's that aspect. That's the law function of the prophetic message. But there is a gospel function. There is a forgiving, gracious dimension that establishes God's purposes and creates hope. That's the gospel function of the prophetic office in the Old Testament. Remember, and I've got Jeremiah 31, Ezekiel 36. I mean, where did we get the idea that there was going to be a new covenant, that God was going to make a new covenant and he would write his laws in our hearts and in our minds? And where did we get the idea that he was going to put his spirit in us and give us a heart of flesh, a new heart, and he was going to forgive our sins and iniquities? We got those from the prophets. That's from Jeremiah and Ezekiel. There is a gospel function. I have to pick a verse to close, so let's look at, uh, let's just look at Jeremiah 29. Because Jer in Jeremiah 29, you see both the law and the gospel function in the same person. Jeremiah is the one that, that prosecuted Israel. He said, exile is coming with disobedience. That's why you can claim that the Lord loves his people and the Lord's always shown mercy to his people and the Lord's always intervened for his people, but not this time. That's what Jeremiah said. He had to counter all these prophets that were claiming the mercy of the Lord, the mercy of the Lord. God's mercy endures forever. His faithful love, his covenant love, his loving kindness. His love endures forever. His mercy. But, it, but mercy didn't work for that situation. Mercy doesn't always work. When you have a disobedient child, sometimes the law function has to come in. Sometimes the mercy function works. God is both, and ultimately mercy triumphs over judgment. That's uh, James 2.13. I'll get that verse in your notes next week. Mercy does triumph over judgment. His hesed, his steadfast love triumphs over judgment. The gospel does triumph over the law function. So here's the same Jeremiah that declared they were going into exile. Jeremiah 29, 1. And we'll close. These are the words of the letter that Jeremiah the prophet sent from Jerusalem to the surviving elders of the exiles and to the priests, the prophets, and all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had taken into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. In other words, the exile has started. Jeremiah is, is shown to be correct. Even though... <laughs> Even after the exile started, there were still prophets saying, oh no, the people are coming back next week. I mean, at, at some point in time, what does it take for God's people to understand what's going on? One of the unfortunate aspects of false prophecy, it puts a veil over our hearts and our minds. And no matter what happens, we still keep persisting in our, our false narrative. What does it take? Well, it takes the mercy of the Lord. Hallelujah. This was after King Jeconiah 
and the queen mother, the eunuchs, the officials of Judah and Jerusalem, the craftsmen, the metal workers had departed from Judah or from Jerusalem. In other words, all the chief leaders of the people. The letter was sent by the hand of Elasa the son of Shaphan and Gemariah the son of Hilkiah, whom Zedekiah king of Judah sent to Babylon to Nebuchadnezzar king of Babylon. It said, now here you're going to see the law functions already there. You've been judged. The Lord is disciplining his people. He's not cutting them off forever. He's disciplining his people. Consequences are to discipline us, not, not to punish us or cut us off forever. It's just, it's a discipline. It's like saying you're grounded for a week because of what you just did. Thus says the Lord of hosts, that's the Lord of armies, the God of Israel. Where were you, Lord? We needed your armies to save us from Nebuchadnezzar. Well, I'm sending my armies to Babylon to save you. The God of Israel to all the exiles whom I have sent in the exile. Not Nebuchadnezzar, I've sent in the exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. All right, it's been a rough season. It's been a rough stretch. Now let's, 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 let's get right and, and let's come into shalom. Build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat their produce. Take wives and have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there and do not decrease. But seek the welfare of the city. Seek the shalom of the city. Seek the blessing of the city. See, this is a prophetic word for American Christians right now. We want to see America blessed. We don't want to see America cursed and America judged. We want to see America blessed. So remove the impediments to injustice, walk in justice, and release the blessing of the Lord. Seek the shalom of the city where I've sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf. For when it prospers, you yourself will prosper. That's the beauty. We need to pray. Whoever, whoever gets into the presidency, we need to pray for blessing and welfare for this nation. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, do not let your prophets and your diviners who are among you deceive you. And do not listen to the dreams that they dream, for it is a lie that they're prophesying to you in my name. I did not send them, declares the Lord. And the lie that he was addressing, there's the law function, judgment of the prophet, discernment of history. They were saying, okay, there, there isn't going to be an exile. Oops, there's an exile. All right. Uh, yeah, the exile's going to end soon. It's like the Jehovah's Witnesses. The Lord is returning in 1890. Oops, he didn't. He's returning in 1900. Oops, he didn't. He's returning in 1914. Oops, he didn't. Oh, he returned invisibly. <laughs> See, that's how false prophecy works. It, it never stops, even when it's proven wrong. He says, no, I said 70 years and I meant 70 years. For thus says the Lord, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will visit you, I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for peace, plans for shalom and not for evil to give you a future and a hope. Do you see in the middle of exile, law function, the gospel is always there, the graciousness of the Lord. And whatever will be the end result of the turmoil we see ourselves in right now, we can also declare there is a gospel dimension to what's going on and the Lord is going to bless his people. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me and I will hear you. You will seek me and you will find me when you seek me with all your heart. See, that's what, the, what, what a real prophet does. I'm hidden now, but seek me with all your heart. Find the hidden Jesus. 
not find the political solution, the economic solution. Find Jesus. That's the gospel function. And I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations and all the places where I have driven you, declares the Lord, and I will bring you back to the place from which I sent you into exile. So there is a law function. Can I have a, a, a wipe? There's a law function, but there's a gospel function in what every prophet says. I, I got the last one. So we're going to close in prayer right now. Mother Joyce, were you? Oh, wait, is George, are you there? George, come on up here and close us in prayer. George Benton, I want you to close us in prayer. Hey Amen. Good morning to everybody. <clears throat> Let's bow our heads. Father God, <clears throat> come before you throne, Lord. I thank you, Lord. I thank you, Lord, for who you are and what you do for all of us, Lord. Father God, I come before your throne. And I just pray, Lord. I ask for healing, I ask for salvation, Lord. Lord God, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it, Lord. I pray, Father God, for your comfort, Lord and your strength and the courage and the hope that we all will see our way through this Corona-19 virus, Lord God. And as the pastor say, Lord, I just pray and ask whoever we're in the presence of Lord, let them do the right thing. Let them be for all people's, Lord God, because we are your children, Lord. I pray, Father God, that your Holy Spirit will have its way, that you will lead and guide us, Lord. I pray that you will comfort those today who need comforting. Heal those who need healing, strengthen those who need strengthen, and break every chain, Lord God. And I pray in extra traveling mercies, Lord, as we set out to go our separate ways. Pray that you will keep your shield of protection around us all, keep us all out of harm's way, and cover us all in your blood. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Now, Mother, Mother Joyce, come on. I said we'll get you next. We'll get both of you. I want, I want, well, I, I didn't mean next week. Who, know, who knows what I meant? Just come on. I, I did, I thought you meant next week. So I got relaxed. <laughs> Whew, hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah. Lord, I thank you, Lord. I thank you so much, Lord. We thank you for one, a wonderful day. We thank you, Lord, for the word that was ministered on today. We pray, Lord, that it touch our hearts, Lord. Fill our hearts, Lord. It edifies us and builds us, Lord. Let us not be at ease in Zion. Let us move forward, Lord, in the things of God. Let us open up our hearts, Lord, not only to receive your word, but to be doers of your word as well. So, Lord, I thank you, Lord. And I pray, Lord, for everyone that's here and everyone that's out there in TV land or Facebook land, Lord, that you touch them, touch their families, Lord, that they may bow knee and serve Jesus. I pray, Lord, that they want to come into the knowledge of who Jesus Christ is. I pray, Lord, for everyone that is sick, right now i pray that you deliver them father god from whatever illness they're battling right now i pray lord that they get up at the sound of jesus and move forward in all that you've called us to do in jesus holy name amen, amen. 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 god bless amen. you guys go in peace oh. serve the lord